Hello, welcome to Tub Talks with David. My very special guest returning to the tub is David Toussaint. Yes, hi, David. How, How are you? Are you? I'm not, wearing, I'm not wearing a hat this time. You're not wearing your hat. Why? No. Why are you not wearing your hat? Because I'm this embracing time? my bald ish head. Uh huh. <laughs> you have a beautiful head. In more that ways than what we're talking about. <laughs> I've seen it all, baby. I've seen it all. I'm so happy you're here. I, it's so nice to be here sharing your talk with you. Yes, You're kind yes. of a hog, though. What's that? You're kind of a hog. You're out of there. You know, I steal the bubbles. <laughs> I steal the sheets. That's just what I do, you know. But you were one of the very first people uh -huh. I approached mm -hmm. to do this series. Mm -hmm. You were one of the first guests that I had mm -hmm. at the very beginning. And now I'm almost at episode 100. Wow. Can you believe it? Okay, wow. So thank you for being there at the beginning. And sure. thank you for being here today. Sure, no problem. I'm so glad you're here. So what I'm still asking guests, because I'm still very curious to know, mm -hmm. is what you like most about your body today. <laughs> well, last time I said, I think I, think I said uh, my penis. Yes. But I just had an operation on it, so I don't know that it's my favorite body part right uh -huh. now because it's swelling. I actually had an operation on my penis. So it's swelling and, and, and not exactly the, the most beautiful thing right now. It so, looked, uh, well, I want to come back and ask you <laughs> when, if I could ask you about that. But before we do, I want to know what you do like about your body. Because it's so easy, I think, for us to talk about what we don't like or what's problematic. Uh, well, that, what like but if I wanted body? to pick a new one, I would say my eyes. Yes. What do you like about your eyes? They're deep and brown. Yes. So uh, I actually do like things other than sexual parts. Yes. So I do, I do, I've always liked my eyes, even when I was an ugly fat child, which is hard to believe. But, um, uh, yeah, no, I do like them a lot. And my lips. Great. <laughs> show, show the people. Show the people your eyes. Show the people. That's a great smile. And beautiful. 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 Now, my veneers. I, I, <laughs> is that your teeth? <laughs> They're beautiful. It's all part of the package. Mm -hmm. Now, I do notice... Uh -huh. That from our first interview, there's a lot less here. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's talk, because I'm always curious. As someone who doesn't have a lot of body hair, I'm always curious as to how and when people choose or decide to uh, manscape or not. Well, I don't like body hair on me. I like it on other men. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I keep it because men that I go out with like it. Yeah. So I, I'll just keep it. But there's a point where I feel... Uh, dirty and what it gets so I have so much so much normally if I would do it it's all over my shoulders and my back and I just had it waxed my, my barber waxes it and uh, uh, uh -huh. when it gets to a certain point I just can't stand it so it's really more about me and then I feel cleaner and I've been consciously trying to gain uh, lose weight so I can see my body better mm -hmm. so it's still there just not just not dark and doesn't look like I'm wearing a mint coat tonight. Okay. Do you feel better or different when it's better. shorter? I feel better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So better than like the last time we sat in the tub. I don't remember what it looked like. It was longer. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it was a big foot or anything. I don't watch myself. Okay. TV. You don't watch your own interviews? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Okay. So, okay. So for you, it, it feels cleaner. It feels lighter. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm envious, like that you don't have hair. I'm to envious you be, do have that it. That would be so much fun. The grass is always yeah, hairier. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, so it, yeah. isn't that interesting though? Because yeah. I feel and like... hairless men tend to like me. Mm -hmm. So uh, go figure. Opposites often appeal. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think you know, I think if we ever could do an objective study. And I don't know if anyone ever has or anyone ever will, but I think if we could do an objective study, I do think men who are hairier get more attraction from others. And of course, that's really? not what this is all about. I mean, the, about what's most important is how you feel. Oh. But I would say that right. you so put a hairy guy and a smooth guy in a club or a situation, really? and more often than not, the hairy guy is going to get more um, attention okay. and affection. Now, I, right. have not, I, think we I don't know do how it. you could do a study. I'm open to it. We could do a study. You and I could do a study. But, we should um, like the eagle together with, with well, the eagle. Shirt on. 
Harrier and guys, so it's kind of a skewed sample. The Harrier, I, I think okay. the Eagles already, well, you already have Harry as like the preference. Okay, all right. So I don't know. We could think of like where's more objective, mm -hmm. but I think the Eagles sort of already skews favorably okay. for Harrier men. Okay. So I'm not sure we get the objective. But I'm older than you, so you know. Does that mitigate the fact? See, I don't know. well, you tell me. So you are now 58. <gasps> He just said my age. Well, you said it last time. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a year and a half ago was our last one, so I just did the math. What does that feel like? Cold. Well, I'm cold. Are you cold? Um, yeah, just a little bit. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, it feels fine. So 59 feels a little weird, which is coming up yeah. um, in April. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, age is a privilege. And we, we say that a lot, and it sounds like it's just a slogan, but it doesn't mean anything that we're just using it to deny the fact that we hate getting older. Mm -hmm. But it really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we've talked about this before, and I've talked about it verbatim, and mm -hmm. is that the right okay, word? But some people here have never heard you speak, so I want you to, to I've say it as I've many, many times in real life, and in my columns, and opinion pieces, and yelling on the street. Uh, I grew up in the age of AIDS, and, and I'm so lucky to be alive. And I have so many friends who died during that time, and, and they didn't see 30, they didn't see 40, they certainly didn't see 50. So it's, it's, it's really a privilege. And there are wonderful things about getting older. There's lots of, lots of benefits. Such as? Um, <laughs> dishwater hands. Uh, getting that reference, it's an old reference. Yes, badge. Um, you, get, you don't care as much about what other people think. I really, I wouldn't have sat here in a tub when I was 28. I probably would have thought that was weird. Uh -huh. It is weird, but I don't, but I don't, now I don't really care. Uh -huh. And I would have been too intimidated to be naked. You know, for the viewers who don't know, we don't have our, we don't have any, any suits on. Right. And I probably would have thought that was really weird and uncomfortable and strange. And now I don't really, it's like, who gives a fuck? Yeah, can I say fuck? Yes, oh, please. Okay. Yeah, if you um, too, we can say fuck. So I don't, I don't really care. Yeah. So th those are two great examples. Me too. I feel like the older I get, the more I embrace the ridiculousness of yeah. me and this tub and whatever feels ridiculous. Yeah. I'm more inclined to want to do it. You, I, I could not have done this interview with you when you were 28 and I was like 22. We could not have, I could not have done this. Mm -hmm. um, it was really after turning 50 that I was like, yeah, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And I was, who cares? Do you think, I know we, you have talked about this in other interviews and interviews with me, but did you ever imagine being this much in demand sexually at the age of 58? No, right I'm much more in demand now. I'm not saying that to brag, but yeah. I'm much more in demand now than I was even 10 years ago. And I don't know, it's, it's all about perfect storm. I don't know what happens to us, but in my 20s, I didn't have, I didn't, I had men, but not a zillion. In my 30s, I had men, but not a zillion. In my 40s, close to a zillion. But no, <laughs> no, I, but um, suddenly I turned 50 and something happened and it's, it's about timing. It's nothing I did except grow older. And all of a sudden it's like when people hit it, people, celebrities have a certain thing that just works. Our own sex lives just work at a certain age for some reason. So I wouldn't, so I, the, the men that I go out with now are men who would never look at, who wouldn't have looked at me when I was, in my, when I was 28. And what do you think is, I mean, again, you said the perfect storm. What do you attribute to that perfect storm? I, it's so hard to know. Do you, do you think it's your confidence at all? Your inner world? Um, maybe. You know, I, you know, that we talk about daddies and all that. And for some reason, and I don't understand it because I'm not a young kid anymore, but we all, and I didn't have a dad. <laughs> we all, that's a big thing now. It's, it, it's, if you're a dad, you're in demand, which goes along with the hairy chest. It's like, you have a hairy chest. Oh, you're my dad. And now we were talking about this before, but now it's dad's son. So it, it's evolved. What's uh, the difference? I don't know, except it's always role play and please dad come over and and you know take care of me um, say fuck or fuck me so you they're using the term dad instead of daddy yeah does that Very mean openly. anything different in terms of the erotic 
experience. I think it's more erotic for some reason, but it's 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 a role play sort of thing, and they want dad to sleep with them. Uh huh. And it's I get that a lot. So and, and when I say when I say my age, it's like oh great, you know. I used to think I had to lie about my age, and now I say it, and they're happy. You know, it's like oh good, I want you to be older. So it's 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 a strange thing, and this will end, and then I'll have no dates. But who knows? But enjoy it while it's here. Do you really think it's gonna end? <laughs> I don't know what will happen. I mean, when I turn sixty, I don't know what will happen. So, are you, are you afraid 61? that when you turn sixty or sixty-one, all of this is just gonna poof, go away? I'm afraid all of it's gonna go away tomorrow. So, yeah. but that's a natural fear. I think that our sex appeal will just will go away. So, and then what? Then I have to find a personality. <laughs> no! <laughs> no! And I'm not ready for we that. We can't do that. I just can't. Put we can't connect to that personality. <laughs> no, we can't have conversations <laughs> and dialogue. It is interesting, though, right? Because no, I know very. I know. I know very many men who. I don't mean to berate anybody who's over sixty, because I know many extremely attractive men who are in their sixties. So but, I'm not saying that to. To say that's a bad age. Well, I think it's just what we're learning here is that we really don't know. We are in uncharted territory here as a generation. Because yes. I'm sure if I asked you 10 years ago, hey, do you think you're going to be in demand and having sex all the time when you're 58? You may have said, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to last. I would have. Yeah. And so here we are today when you're 58 saying, I don't know if this is going to last tomorrow or beyond 60. Well, yeah. maybe that's because we don't have, you and I don't really have a whole lot of role models yeah, for how to do nice. this. So we're kind of the we ones Leslie charting Jordan. this. We have Leslie Jordan. <laughs> you passed away. Uh, um, but maybe that's because, like, so we're, we're charting this because we don't mm -hmm. know. And that's why maybe it's a little bit scary and nebulous. Like, it feels like it could go away tomorrow. But I have a feeling... You and I in this bathtub in 10 years might be having a very same conversation. You're going to be like, wow, I just never thought there was a, 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 a market for the granddad at 68, but here we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would not be surprised. Can we um, make that a goal to, to check in again about sure. this in 10 years? Yeah. And yeah. this or some bathtub yeah, we'll find out. Watch this video on that. Maybe you will. <laughs> but it does speak to that fact that culturally um we don't have you and i have not grown up with a whole lot of role models we've known individuals but we well, haven't known a whole we, lot of we did but they were women at least for me right so i didn't have male role models that I mean, gay I had, male role models who were vibrant yeah. sexy and powerful i had one and he died of aids yeah. and i went out with him when i was 31 i think and he was 49 mm. and i loved him Mm -hmm. And he was from that era of just the old New York and New York, you know, drank martinis and had this beautiful house and beautiful floors and beautiful friends and knew all about that New York that was so sophisticated, that era from the 70s and everything. And he died. Yeah. So. And we just recently lost a friend. I just want to say mm -hmm. rest. I, ha I haven't given an acknowledgement to Howard Bragman mm -hmm. on this show, That's but I wanted to, you know... That's another example of someone extremely vibrant and playful and mm -hmm. fun and, and mm -hmm. you know, has been part of our lives. That's um, not how we met. No. No, that isn't no, how we met. You introduced me to Howard. I introduced you to Howard. 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 And, you know, someone who, again, is just someone who has gone way too soon in the gay community. Mm -hmm. But someone yeah. who has also shown me um, how to be older and still be vibrant and playful mm -hmm. and fun. Yeah, you know, and maybe it's not going to be about the quantity. Maybe it's going to be about the quality. I think he lived yeah. a really, really full life until he yeah. couldn't. And unfortunately, you know, he was ill, and I don't think we knew it. You and I didn't know it. I, I don't think no most. Idea. I don't think anyone publicly knew it. Yeah. But that's kind of an example. It's like we've known so many people who have died early, either mm -hmm. because of AIDS or in other health-related concerns in the game. And it's so strange now because they're dying. Of natural causes, or not natural causes, but like heart disease. That for us, that's a natural cause yeah. because everybody just died of AIDS. So now yeah. people die of a very good friend, Ari, who died of cancer. Yeah. They they uh, both died friend. of leukemia. Yeah, and that's right. Ari, the wonderful Ari Gold, and he passed away two yes. years ago, and it's been two years since. And, and I had another friend who died of another form of cancer. So it's it's interesting now that these these people who 
we just worry about age and now they're dying of other things, which is life. So. That is life. Um, I know my, my parents are in their 80s and they've been, in the last 10 years, had to deal with these issues. But mm -hmm. for them, it's the first time they really had to deal with their peers passing off. Mm -hmm. We've been dealing with this pretty much all of our adult lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do think what that has kind of left us with is, again, sort of this blank canvas in terms of aging. Like, we don't really have a blueprint. And that's mm -hmm. why I love these conversations with you. And thinking about, and your writing often talks about, so what do we want to do here? What do we want to do with this privilege of getting older and being vibrant and sexy? And how do we really embrace that? And we're not going to... We're not going to be left alone. Um, I've written about that so much before, and, and I've written about the fact that we're ignore, we've been ignored so much in, in movies and, and television and all that because we weren't supposed to live, and we don't have the ro we don't have the traditional role models. Of, I mean, we don't have the tradition of marriage and kids and all this stuff that gay men are growing up with now. Mm -hmm. We have nothing. Mm -hmm. We were just supposed to live for the weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's very different, and, and I think the media has ignored us for a long time. But most of us have money, and most of us have love to watch TV and love to go to movies, and so I think we're finally being recognized a little bit with, with that, that show, which I don't like, but I'm, I'm so glad it was on Uncoupled. And <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's a... A nice thing to say and a bad thing to say because I wasn't crazy. What? Why are you? No, I'm just shifting. I wasn't getting out of the tub. I'm <laughs> just shifting. <laughs> it's going on. Are you going on? Um, no, no, I agree. That was it. Was unusual in um, trying to or attempting to tell well, a fictional story about someone in their fifties. A, a gay man who was fifty years old. Yeah. And I was so thrilled that that that, that was on. Yeah. So. And it just got picked up by Showtime. By Showtime. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's going to continue. Yeah. Maybe they'll do something with it. Maybe. I wrote an article saying I didn't like it, so I no, guess I anybody like can find it and say horrible things to me on there. And so. Yeah. So perhaps there is a growing branch of representation, mm -hmm. but I think we're part of that. To me, that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. I know for some people there's a lot of it. Um, anxiety. A lot of people have talked about, well, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be left alone or lonely or put out to pasture. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, well, if we're put out to pasture, it's going to be a really fun pasture because there's going to be a lot of us out there. Mm -hmm. Now, let's also talk about your penis. <laughs> can we do that? Can yes, we talk we about can. your penis? Yes, we can. Okay. Because you mentioned earlier that you recently had a procedure done. I did. On your penis. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering what that is and what do you want to say about that? I have something called angiokeratomas, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So if somebody wants, to, if somebody wants to, to correct me, that's fine. And basically it's blood cells that you can get. It's basically they're benign tumors anywhere in your body. And they come out when you're young. And mine happen to come out in the very tip of my penis. So, But they get more noticeable with age. They get bigger with age. So... They're not, oh, they're not dangerous. They're not going to break or anything like that. So they're not dangerous for me or for anybody else, for any sexual partner that I have. I sometimes, some men don't notice them. Some do and have thought that I've had, say, herpes or something like that. Mm. And I finally decided to get rid of them. And I thought that that would be, I didn't think I could, for one thing. And then I just uh, found a laser surgeon who would do it. So I had them <clears throat> surgically removed via lasers. Okay, so these are like red dots? Little dots, yeah. On your, yeah. the head of your penis that yes. people mistook for herpes or some people, uh, something yeah. else. And some people didn't believe me when I said they were otherwise, so. Okay. So has that been a problem? With a couple people, yeah. Okay. Yeah, some Maybe. people accused me of lying and said I had you know, herpes or it was disease or something like that and ran out of the room, but you know, so. Okay. I have to say, I've seen your penis, I've never noticed, but... Okay. <laughs> you know, there's also, I know a lot of... There was, there. there was swelling. Okay. Oh, when I had the operation, there was swelling. Uh -huh. So I actually had to send... So I called my doctor, who ha I won't say his name, but he happens to be gay. Mm -hmm. And I called and left a message for him and said, you know, there's swelling, swelling, I'm a little worried about it. Like, I hope it didn't scab or something like that or scar. Mm -hmm. And the woman says, send us a picture of the inflamed area and he'll look at it. So I got the phone, I'm thinking, I'm actually sending a dick pic to my doctor. <laughs> yeah. 
like, can I get arrested for this? Um, <laughs> well, it's a consenting adult. <laughs> so, Not yet. Um, so, but apparently it's okay. Okay. Yeah. It'll be prettier and more beautiful than ever in, oh. in a week or so. Okay, and so when I'll was, come back for that episode. Okay. Was this a painful procedure? No. Oh, actually, it pinches a little bit when they do it. You know, when they first, it's like somebody's sticking the little needles in your penis. Ooh. So, yeah, it hurts for a second, but that's it. Okay. Is yeah. it like local um, anesthetic or? No, or nothing. So you're nothing. awake the whole time. I am. And, and you feel a little <laughs> pinprick, but nothing. Yeah, it's like a pinprick. And then the lasers, you feel a little heat, but that's okay. it. Okay. And how long did it take? Five minutes. Wow. Okay. Because I've never heard of this before. Yeah. So I'm curious. I thought it would be, I knew it was um, cosmetic. So I always thought it would cost thousands of dollars to have it removed. Plus I was a little scared because mm -hmm. don't, you don't want to fuck around with that area because if, if you mess something up and you're in trouble, you know, it's ew. And then the first dermatologist I went to said, I can't do it, but here's a great guy who can. And he said how much it would probably cost. I'm like, that's it? You know, I just thought it would be so. What about how how much? Oh, for the whole thing of less than a thousand dollars. So I, and insurance I literally doesn't... no because it's believe it or not it, it is cosmetic. Okay. So I literally, but I literally thought we'd be talking like thousands of dollars. Yeah. I just didn't know. I never really thought about it. Yeah. So I decided, what the hell? Okay. You know, and so I've never had laser surgery anywhere else. So uh -huh. you know. And are you in any pain now? I'm in pain during this interview, but no. <laughs> Other than the excruciating pain of talking with me, is your penis in pain? No, it's not. Okay, so in the recovery... I'm not allowed to use it for another two days, though. <laughs> so does that mean even for your own, you can't check off? Uh, yeah, you didn't actually say, you said no friction. No friction. So I assume that means no to the to jerking off, but um, but that's how he said it. He said no friction. Okay. I did feel like say, could you define friction? Define friction, yeah. yeah. You know, Until Friday. Okay. So Friday's going to be a big day. <laughs> Better get on Grindr. <laughs> Upper East Side. Just saying. Uh, okay. So how did you find out about this procedure? And I... I asked my doctor, who is straight, uh -huh. and was very uncomfortable about it, oh. and told me to go to a dermatologist. He looked it up. He looked it up. He didn't know what it was. I was initially told that it was a varicose vein mm -hmm. when I first found out about it way back in college. And then he just said, go to a dermatologist. I hadn't thought about that. The dermatologist said, no, it's angiokeratomas. And, um, but I, I can't do it. For some reason, he just didn't work on that area. He did offer to get, he very kindly offered to get rid of my brown spots in my face. But, uh, one of the joys of getting older. But, he knew somebody who would do it, so. Okay. And he looked it up and found out what it was. And when I went to see this doctor, he right away just looked at, held my penis in front of the, the nurse. You know, and they're just holding my penis and studying it. And he goes, oh, I, this is an angio character. I mean, this is so common, blah, 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 blah. I can do this in five minutes, blah, 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 blah. Wow. Okay. So. Modern science. That's good to know. So again, this is one of these aspects of health that I wasn't mm -hmm. familiar with. And mm -hmm. I appreciate now knowing that, that that's an option for people. Mm -hmm. um, if they're having this, if they're... and they get them, you can get them all over anywhere. So okay. that just happens to be where I got mine. Do I have them? I don't think I have them. Not that I know of, but we'll do a thorough examination. Okay. Okay. okay, sure. <laughs> so I appreciate that you're always so open and honest. What do you do? Getting a better yeah. angle. Okay. <laughs> all right. And feel free to adjust and move around the cabin. <laughs> um, your writing, I think, is is so. Re you help people learn things. And you also help challenge people. And I know sometimes you don't always get positive feedback on that. Yeah, but who gets positive feedback? I mean, we live in a hateful world. So let's talk so, about that. And it's not the real world. It's the, it's the social media world. Okay. That's hateful. So, well, it trickles into the real world. But, but I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time in social media anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't read, I don't read comments unless, unless they're shoved in front of me or their personal emails, which I get a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, 
But it is, I mean, you have to remember, it's blank people behind computers writing whatever right. the hell they want. Right. So, which makes it all the more hateful. But right. I, I ignore those for the most part. So you, a lot of your writing is about gay men and traits you observe or things mm -hmm. you're seeing happening. Mm -hmm. Recently, you wrote about the social media reaction to Madonna um, at the Her face. Grammys. The Grammys. The Grammys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that there was a lot of commentary and really negative things that gay people were saying about Madonna. Yeah, and you know I'm a huge fan of Madonna. Yeah. It happened since the start. And <clears throat> her face is really none of our business, mm -hmm. ultimately. I mean, I, we all have personal feelings about what she's doing, how she's growing old and growing older. And we probably, every single, that's the thing, if you do read the comments, every single person has their own opinion of how you age gracefully. And they almost all phrase it that way. Like, why, does, why doesn't she age gracefully like Cher? Why didn't she age gracefully like Dolly Parton? Why doesn't she age gracefully like Belinda Carlisle? It's always like they pick their own person or Michelle Pfeiffer or something. And I always feel like, first of all, you, you, you mention a lot of people, not necessarily those ones, but who had a ton of work. Right. And, and you're forgetting that, just you prefer theirs. You know, it, it's a very strange thing. And, and I think that, I, I don't understand the need to be hateful about it. I, I can see being disappointed or going, oh, I don't, it's like, like not liking somebody's dress. I don't like that dress they're wearing or something like that. I don't like the outfit they chose. But to be so hateful and just the old age comments, it's all, all about how old she is. Mm -hmm. And, and, and sh if she were a man, and it sounds like a cliche, they wouldn't be talking about what work or what work she hadn't ha yeah. done. Exactly. Yeah, you because know, men have tons of work. Yeah. And I'll notice it on men, and you don't hear anybody talk about it. So I remember when Jane Fonda and Robert Redford were in that movie recently, and, and she was being, everybody was talking about her work, and that horrible woman who thinks she's a newscaster, Megan... Kelly, Kelly uh, was interviewing them and asked Jane Fonda about her work, the work she had on her face, and Jane Fonda didn't like the question. And I so badly wanted Jane Fonda to say, why don't you ask Robert Redford about the work he's had in his face? Yeah. You know, why don't we not make this a double standard? So that we're, we're so weird about women. And right now, I feel like they're, they're, they have no... They have no guidance. It's like they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. But the, the bottom line is we don't need to be so cruel about it. You know, that's that's not helpful you know and except it, 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 and, and I see it happening with men our age who seem to love hating Madonna why do you think that is I because they hate themselves mm. I think she always sort of has reflected us mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. from the beginning which is why she got so famous we kind of saw her in us mm -hmm. and as we get older we're doing everything to our faces and bodies and so forth and I know men who had every possible fucking thing done you know, not just on their penis, and 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 they're writing horrible things about her. Mm -hmm. You know, and they've got thirteen-year-old boyfriends, and 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 that's what I, that's what it's like. What's going on there? This seems like a little self-hatred. Yeah. You know. So in my field, we call that projection. Yeah. Okay. You're projecting yeah. Projecting your internal hatred, yeah. and homophobia onto an outside source. And the thing is, maybe if we left her alone, she wouldn't be so compelled to do anything. You know, maybe if we talked, didn't talk about her as being so old and ugly, which we've been doing for years. I mean, that's she hasn't. She wasn't just old and ugly now, and I'm saying old and ugly, obviously in quotes. She was old and ugly when she was like 35. You know, that's when the comments first got really horrible because she's this huge, huge sex symbol, and sex symbols do not age. Mm -hmm. We don't let them unless they're Sophia Loren, mm -hmm. and so she not supposed to live she's basically not supposed to have lived and we don't like that we don't like that she's thriving and we're jealous of her it's like how dare she there's a sort of an envious factor when all these other people have died and she's survived and she was never the one who was considered <clears throat> the best at what she did of, of her generation and she's really the only one who lived so one of the few from that Genre, yeah, of, of Prince and Michael Jackson, and all those people, David George Bowie, Michael, and George all Michael, people. Whitney Houston, Whitney Houston, you know, didn't didn't last, didn't make it, you know. Sheena Easton is still with us. 
Thank God. God for Sheena. Yeah. yeah. I love She's Sheena. She's still here. I know. Is she, is she here? No, I wish. She could come to the bathtub anytime. But yeah, from that genre, you know, people, it's mystifying to me. Once somebody dies, they're beyond reproach. Mm -hmm. But while they're Whitney alive, Houston. they're right. Like Whitney, you know, Once I remember she social died, media. Oh my gosh, the saddest thing in the world when she was alive. People were saying horrible things. Cool. Horrible so things about cool. her. Yeah. About her voice, about everything. Mm -hmm. You know. So I re I've always been a very appreciative fan. And I realize I do project a lot of Madonna. But I'm aware of that. I try to, with celebrity figures like Madonna, like Cher, consciously choose to project what I consider to be positive side. The things I see in them, I think, are reflections of myself. Mm -hmm. And I use that very intentionally in a loving way. I say that Cher gave me permission to come out as gay in high school because I was projecting so much on her when she won the Academy Award for Moonstruck. Mm -hmm. uh, Madonna has always has deeply shaped my career and my ability to talk about sexuality in such an openly defiant way and to savor it when people don't like it. I think like she it. did that to all of us, for all of us, yeah. you know? But like, and I was 19. All rules. I was against everything and we weren't supposed to be doing it or talking yeah. about it. And she did it just a blatant pop mainstream way. Yeah. She didn't do it behind closed doors and little, in little clubs. Right. It was very, very, I mean, she was the biggest star in the world. I mean, she made a movie about just reveling in the critics and the pulp who were telling yeah. her that you are sinful yeah. and disgusting and you shouldn't be doing this as a woman. Mm -hmm. She made Truth or Dare, and I was 19 mm -hmm. when I saw that movie for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I just remember how much it impacted me. Which, and if you've never seen, you must see it. Absolutely. It's still one of the best documentaries ever made. You know, and that kind of defiance helped me much later in life when I started to get the hate and the nasty stuff related to sexual health and prep. Mm -hmm. So I look at Madonna, I'm like, this is someone who's emulated so many values that, that I appreciate and respect. And she was a huge AIDS, AIDS ally. So Long before it was okay. Long before it was okay to, to like gay people, even, even gay people in general. Yeah. So she basically came to, came to fame in the age of AIDS. Yeah. Now, all that being said, I am a little mystified by what she's doing publicly these days. Mm -hmm. I'm not against her, and it's mm -hmm. her world. She gets to do whatever she wants. Yeah, but I too. just I feel a little mystified by the messages, by the social media she's putting out, by yeah. her stuff at the Grammys, which it wasn't the look that I thought that I didn't appreciate. It was mm -hmm. sort of this seeming entitlement that people were should be stopping in their tracks to speak to her. And she made a comment about people not paying attention to her during her speech. And I'm just like, well, she's not, I know within that industry, a lot of people don't like her. They respect mm -hmm. her, but they don't like her as a person. Mm -hmm. She's not a friendly person. Mm -hmm. So it in a room at like the Grammys, a lot of people aren't gonna stop yeah. to speak to her. And, and I just felt there was so much conflated in that brief speech she gave. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Mm, I kind of wish. But wouldn't it be great if we were just discussing this and mm -hmm. not her face? Mm -hmm. you, you yeah. You know what I mean? Everything yeah, was to about me wasn't, her face. Right. That, yeah. that gets lost. To me, I, I would like to see, and again, it's me projecting. Because people say, well, it's okay to write mean things about her face because she's mean. And it's like, well, write that she's mean. Right. Write that you don't like the way she, you don't like what she does on social media. Write that you don't like what she says. Or what she's doing, like you just said. That's yeah. what I was saying. Instead, they turn into something very superficial, which is like being on the playground and, and kicking somebody instead of just saying, hey, I want to talk to you about this. Right. Which I think also comes from the fact that we come from a community of so many people that were bullied, mm -hmm. never given adequate therapy or tools for dealing with hatred, being mm -hmm. the recipient of hatred. Mm -hmm. And we're not given the proper tools or healthy tools to deal with being the recipient of hatred. We're just gonna internalize it and turn it right around and dump it on somebody else. Yeah, yeah. That's what I also feel like is going yeah. on on yeah. social media when people criticize Madonna or like Rihanna at the Super Bowl, when that was another thing that everybody was whining about. It was like, you're just projecting your own shit. You're, the bullied is becoming the bully. Right? Those who have been receiving toxic shit and never processing it are the ones outpouring with criticism and attack. Whenever I watch the Super Bowl halftime, 
And it's, I don't watch it every year. All I can think of is how did they do that? Amazing. In front of 75 bazillion hundred people. That's what I'm thinking the entire time. Yeah. Like, how do they do it? What drugs do they take to get them on that stage? <laughs> And I'm serious. I mean, I used to be an actor. I know how, how nerve-wracking it is just to be in front of 100 people. So, And I, that's what I, I think. So I'm always watching that. And maybe that is the performer, I mean, paying attention to that part. And not, do I like the choice of songs? Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, I, I judge it as a performance and think some are better than others. But that's sort of more how I see it than anything else right you know? I, I again i see it it's like it. people don't realize how much goes into it they just think it's it's yeah it's i don't know yeah they just get together and raise a platform and sing yeah yeah or don't sing or don't sing right <laughs> she, she rihanna lip synced quite a bit of that <laughs> which is good fair to criticize that i just mm -hmm. don't when i see people making a story about this like this is bad this is you know she should be canceled or someone should be canceled mm -hmm. if they're saying or doing or appearing the wrong way. Mm -hmm. There, I think, we get into a ground that's not conducive to joy, to health, to pleasure, all mm -hmm. these things that aging can offer us. But it's not going to feel like that if we're constantly scanning for ways to criticize well, and Why are we so aid. perplexed about Madonna for all these years? I mean, we're still talking about because it. she's pushing boundaries. We're still sitting because, in a we're sitting in a bathtub a hundred years later talking about her. Yeah, because like you and I aging, she's doing something that has really never been done before. Yeah, she's yeah. aging up and maintaining her artistic integrity yeah. and doing something a woman or any entertainer has ever done in terms of sustaining output for forty plus years. Yeah, yeah. No one's ever done it before. And certainly no woman has ever done it no before. Done so it she's, that. I'm fascinated by that. And mm -hmm. I think that's why people are projecting so much on her. And sometimes... Because the people who, who and it's it's usually the fans who say, I'm a big fan, but hate her. And, which I never quite understand. Which is a di big difference between saying, but I have a big criticism. Which mm -hmm. I criticized her last concert. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't like it very much. The fact that she came out so late was a big part of it. And you know, I go to you know me. I go to bed at like six p.m. So, uh, <laughs> what time is it? Um, so uh, I lost my train of thought. So you can be critical of people you respect, of artists you respect, mm -hmm. of leaders you respect. We can do that in a way that's loving and respectful. If we don't like the show, we don't like the message. Mm -hmm. There's ways to do that that still honor who they are. And by extension, honor who. Oh, we... I know what I was going to say. If you really want her to go away, stop talking about her. Uh huh. That's ultimately, and she has said that herself many mm -hmm. times. If, if I'm so boring and so uninteresting, why does everyone still talk about me? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you always read these articles about how much I hate, they hate Madonna, hate Madonna, hate. Well, why are you writing the article? Why are you looking at her? I don't follow her on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know, and I like her. I don't because I stopped enjoying what she was doing on Instagram, so I just stopped following it. I don't watch everything she does, and but I also don't claim to hate her. It's this weird, vicious cycle. Like I'm just gonna just gonna keep trashing her and saying she needs to go away while I'm perpetuating her career. Yeah. Right. So the antidote to that would be, as you said earlier, it to be you can be critical of mm -hmm. the message. Mm -hmm. Not the appearance. Is that what you were saying earlier? Like, why why talk about her face? You could say she's mean. You could say I don't like what she's saying. And you can, but why you can have your own personal feelings about yeah. it. I think it's sort of a an area that should be sort of uh, off limits. Mm -hmm. I just think it's cruel to attack any of these features. Mm -hmm. And I think probably more so women's features because they've gone through... I mean, look at our last president. They've gone through so much from from men mm -hmm. and so much from society about how they're supposed to look and they're we'll never know they're struggling they're fighting their own battle and doing their own thing and they're figuring it out and let them figure it out and talk amongst themselves yeah. and do that it's not really for us to dictate yeah we can have our own feelings about it mm -hmm. you know i love the fact that jamie lee curtis has never had plastic surgery mm -hmm. and loves to talk about it and, and all that's very interesting that's her choice. Yeah. As other people make other choices, neither of them are wrong. Mm -hmm. 
You know, we may have an opinion about them, but they're not wrong. Madonna's not blowing things up. Mm-hmm. She's not blowing people up. She's not killing people. She's not starting wars. She's not... Well, she tried to in the um, American Life video. She did. That's true. <laughs> Which she was tried. a great video. It was actually a great video before she cut it. Cut it. Under right. pressure. But, but the actual video is, is on YouTube now. So people I know. You can know. see the they, they, The censored version. It's now very tame. Right. Right. If you look at it now, it's very compared tame. to January six. It's extremely tame. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 But, so. <laughs> but you know, so this is again, like I think we're going to talk about. Let's things. choose our battles too about who we want to really go after. Mm-hmm. You know, is it we really want to spend your time going after her where there's these really horrible people trying to stop us mm-hmm. every minute of the day, you, know, you and me, from being in this tub and so forth. So, and that's again an interesting psychological mechanism where people go after. Um, the person that they feel more closest to. So I think a lot of people know that they could say anything about Marjorie Green on Facebook and who cares, like she's so out there. No one mm-hmm. could, no one's gonna care, right? She's yeah. just, when you talk about Madonna, we're talking about someone who's more within our circle, with someone yeah. we feel yeah. some mix she of affection for, right? She's the, she's, she's the closer one. And I think yeah. that represents family dynamics, that a lot of times mm-hmm. in our families, traditionally we will, focus on someone we are angry with, someone we're upset with, a mother, a father, a brother mm. that we're angry with versus someone outside who's actually trying to do harm mm-hmm. to you and the community you live in. met my family. Chew <laughs> <laughs> that. Chew that. All right. But it's this interesting thing that people go after someone who they feel closer to. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I always yeah. say she brings out the bitch brunch in men. Yeah. And she, she tends to sort of do that. So. Yeah. So I just did this um, workshop with the Life Group, thank you, mm-hmm. Sunny, um, about complaining. And one of the things we talked about were different you approaches to... Yeah. You're going to get better angle than I am. <laughs> you know, just like complaining is... To, I mean, literally complaining. Stanford University did a lot of studies on the brain. We know it's not healthy for you. We know it affects the hippocampus. Yeah. So I can't complain about my camera angle? You can do anything you want. But it's accumulatively going to have effect on your brain, on the cortisol in your system, your blood mm-hmm. pressure, heart disease, all that stuff. As mm-hmm. Incessant complaining hurts you. Okay. It's also just this thing like you're pointing out what you don't like about yourself every time you bitch and whine about somebody else you think is doing something wrong. This is the central premise in both my books. Um, that when you're sh- focusing on the errors and mistakes of others, you're really illuminating and reflecting on the mistakes on yourself Mm -hmm. and what would be a much more different approach to mental health and aging is first saying what is it that i don't like about me or something i'm doing or thinking or something i'm fearing that i see represented Mm -hmm. in other people this is what i do with madonna because i really was put off by the whole grammy thing but i'm also like instead of blaming her for that i'm like so what was it like what about me what about my fear what about my narcissism and need for approval and attention was being what buttons were being pushed Mm -hmm. by seeing her carry on that way during her speech. Mm-hmm. So I want to learn from that because I think the more I learn from that, the more I understand how to work with that in a way that's more conducive mm-hmm. to the kind of joy and serenity and pleasure that I think aging can offer us. Mm-hmm. But if we just keep it at that level of like, no, she's the reason I'm upset. You're the reason. David's nasty journalism is the reason and I don't like, I'm not feeling good today and I'm going to blame them for that. Send. That's a lower level vibration. That's a lower mm-hmm. level brain activity that keeps us Stagnant. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I was just. That's okay. my whole. That's my whole. I've got to tell you, I'm a stalker on crying word. You do? Yeah. Who's that? that? I don't know. Oh, how I is mean, he stalking I, you? He's been stalking me for three years. So. How does he do that? Aware of this, he keeps uh, finding me and writing how horrible I am and saying horrible things about me. Oh, that sucker! And then yeah, and then I report him and block him, and then he comes up again. Oh, okay. He's been doing this. So he knows who you are as a public person. As your like for your oh writing. I don't know I don't know oh so he no, doesn't like more, you he's such, I guess I turned him down a long time oh ago. okay so it's more personal yeah it's been going on for three years yeah so that's not really conducive to healthy mental health or aging no it's not it's yeah. really not yeah. and it doesn't feel good to be on the receiving end of that mm-hmm. you mentioned before this interview as well just in terms of your own life and dealing with issues of anxiety and OCD mm-hmm. can you say more about what that is for you what those mean. 
Um, I have had uh, horrific OCD since the age of 16. And uh, it, it almost killed me. Um, I had the most horrible 20s of, I mean, from 16 to 31 or something until I was diagnosed were horrible times. I had intrusive thoughts, which I still have. And it comes out in a variety of ways where you can't, where you, you can't um, get a thought out of your head, whether it be nuclear war or death or, or uh, things more personal, speech, worry, worrying about the way you speak, worrying about words coming out of your mouth, about how you form sentences so that you can't form them. Worrying about how many times your eyes blink. So uh, I would have I would have leery eyes all the time because I'd be worried about. I'd be trying to count the times I wink. And I also had something called, <clears throat> which I still get called derealization, where nothing is quite real, and everything looks like it's some sort of a movie, and you're not in it. And they're all terrifying. I had that. And then horrible, just horrible, horrible anxiety, which I still get. I told you it was having some today. Um, and I just, I, I mean, I took care of it by drinking in my 20s because I went to doctors and they all said it was my, ironically in my head. And I would, uh, nothing, and we tried everything and nothing worked. And, and, but I was, I was asking, you know, they were asking me if my father beat me or things like that. It was all, all ridiculous. And um, I've written about this. I've never really talked about it, so forgive me if I'm uh, if it's hard to do. Uh, it's just debilitating. I quit acting because of it um, because I would have panic attacks on stage. I uh, and people weren't real on stage. I was a juggler at City Opera, and I remember making a joke once that I was juggling in front of three thousand five hundred people who weren't there because it wasn't real. And it, it's, it's just horrifying. And I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't want to live. So, because I didn't think it was ever gonna go away. And I remember telling my boyfriend, when I was about 30, my boyfriend at the time, that I wanted to die if it kept going on. And I still remember that. I remember that he was so, so upset that I said that. And when I was, I can't remember how old. I, I want to say about 31 or 32. I found a doctor who found medication that worked, that helped. Do you remember what that was? It was uh, Clonopin and Wellbutrin mm -hmm. combined. And I had pretty much, I had really given up. And was so surprised when he suggested it. And I didn't think it would, you know, I was like, okay, fine. I'll try it. Uh, and I remember it took a while, but I started to feel better. And within a couple of weeks, something was happening. My brain started functioning right. And it was kind of like a, a wonder drug. And it was how I heard it. I had a friend around the same time who was an actor who had discovered Prozac. He had depression, which I don't suffer from. I mean, I get depressed, but if I get depressed, I know why I'm depressed. And he just had horrible, horrible depression and Prozac worked for him. And I remember just telling him, it's like, I finally found this thing that works. And we've both found these these wonderful things that have worked. So, and you have to remember, this is going back a long time. So this was before medication was prescribed for everything. And it was also more taboo. So it was hard to talk about. And um, that's about it. So I still take medication. I still see a doctor. I still have bad times and bad days, but it's much more manageable. Mm -hmm. What medications are helpful today? I don't want to say. Okay, thank you. For whatever reason, okay. I feel that's that's it's thank it's you. different for everybody. Yeah. Um, but did it, it need to be changed over time? Mm -hmm. Okay. We just changed it again. Okay. So yeah, but yeah, you know, I come. My father killed himself when when I was five, and he was not well. So it's hereditary. And Is that what he was suffering from? Well, we don't know exactly. We think he might have been schizophrenic. Um, he was a very unhealthy man. So, but all we know about was from my mom because he died in 1969. So that was really a time when people didn't talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And he was seeing a psychiatrist, but the psychiatrist, my mother hated the psychiatrist. They were divorced, but my mother hated the psychiatrist. He was very, very sick. He was a very bad husband to her. Um, 
and you know he took his own life so it's there and there are other people in my family history who've had very strange things mm -hmm. so i feel like i'm lucky that i've, I've found help yeah. for it so and thank you for talking about it mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes people watching this interview may understand more. May they will. To help themselves. They will. Because whenever I have written about it, I, all, I always get a letter saying I have this or something similar or my brother does mm -hmm. or my mother did or my father does or something like that. Wow. Yeah. But the worst part was acting because I loved acting and that was, that was, um, it was just too hard. And then I got horrible, horrible stage fright. And, and... I lied. I told everybody I was tired of acting, and it was the lying that was almost almost as bad as the other part. And that wasn't true at all. It was a complete lie. I loved acting. At this stage in your life, would you wish to return to acting? Yeah, terrifies me, but yeah. What terrifies you? The same thing as before. Yeah, because it, it happened in such a horrible way, but. Um, um, yeah, I would. I would love to do it. I should. I should do it. So it's an option for you. You could. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So today, when you say you had an anxious day, what does that mean to you today? Um, it means for no reason. This is what's current. What currently when I when I have this, it, for no reason, I just get a ton of anxiety. It's not about the world. It's not about this interview. It's not about anything. It's just there. Like my brain just says, you're going to be really fucking anxious today. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I told a friend of mine before I came here much earlier today, I said, I just want to lie down and go to sleep for the rest of the day. And not sleep, just lie down and, and, and eat a sundae or ice cream and watch Netflix. And the thing is, I didn't want to do this interview because of that. And I want to do this interview, so that's that's a different thing. I love being social. I have it's 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 a very strange disease, and it is a disease to have, because it contradicts who you are. And because I love being social, I love going out, I love seeing people, I love talking about myself, um, I love doing all these things, but it inhibits it. And I love attention, and. Uh, I, I, before I, when I was walking back from the gym this morning, I saw a neighbor of mine who I adore and he was so nice and I thought, oh, please don't talk to me, please don't talk to me because it was so bad and I didn't know how I'd hold a conversation with him and he started talking to me. Now, normally I would love that because he's a sweetheart and I love my neighbors and it was real hard to hold the conversation. I finally just said I had a really hard workout, I'm really tired, so. Is there anything? So we still lie, and I still love people who don't believe me, and think I'm making it up. People think you're making it up. Yeah, and you, that that's never quite gone away. Not not most people, but some people do. So that's so they don't believe people, that you look at the Tom Cruises of the world who don't believe in these things. So there are. But there, I mean, people in your life, in your life. Yeah, yeah, but I've gotten rid of most of them. Some it's they're harder to get rid of than others, mm -hmm. but. But, you know, when you think about Tom Cruise or somebody like that, there's, those people are all over the place telling us that, that we don't have these things, that it's all in our head. So, I mean, in Tom Cruise's ideology is informed by a specific cult, cult yeah, Scientology. Yeah, but, you're yeah. feeling like, but you're saying like non-cult members, non-Scientology yeah. people. Yeah, and I've had ex-boyfriends who thought it was all made up and I had to get rid of them. So, um, and they would always say, if you just meditated, it'll go away. Or if you just did this, it would go away. You want it to happen, David. You want it there. And, and what does it feel like when someone says that It's to you? horrifying. Because it's like saying you want to have cancer. And which I've had friends pay, say to people who have cancer. Because um, you know deep down that's wrong. And that's not the case. But it, it's, it's, it's actually kind of terrifying. Because you think, what if everybody... And you look fine. That's the other thing you get. You look fine. You look great. Today at the gym, somebody told me how good I looked. Because I lost a little weight. And he just said, oh, you look so good. You can't... I don't have a cold. I don't have a broken arm. I don't have things that are obvious to see. So I, I have my vision. I have my hearing. What's left? <laughs> I'm losing my, my, my hearing. Um, but you don't see it. So you have to tell people I'm having a bad day. 
And you've got to learn to do that because you won't survive if you don't do that. And you just won't because you, you just, you're lying. Your whole life is a lie. It's like not telling people you're gay. And, and you, you can't, you can't live that way. And to the people who don't believe in it, it's, it's hard, but you have to get rid of them. You know, you just have to say, you know, go away. That's fine. Yeah. You're, you don't have to believe in this, but go away. Um, do you feel like in a post-COVID world, there's more understanding about mental health and anxiety? I think there's more understanding um, lately, and I'm not sure why. I'm reading a lot more articles about it, mm -hmm. and more people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate the term mental illness so much. Mm -hmm. I like mental health much better. Mm -hmm. Mental illness is such a degrading term. It just did I just use it? Did I, say I don't health? even know. Okay. I wasn't saying it. Okay. Okay. For that reason, <laughs> if you did, I, usually, I think you said mental health. Okay. But, but I mean, I used to say I'm mentally ill, and I hate that term. Yeah. So now I say mental health. Yeah. But I notice people have talked about their mental health, and and other people do probably take advantage of it and take too many pills and do all these things and say I'm, I'm having a bad day, so I'm going to take a pill. Once again, you can criticize what's going on and think that too many people are overly medicated. But that doesn't mean it, 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 it's bad. I mean, if you're schizophrenic, you need to take medication. Yeah. You know, if you suffer, I had a boyfriend who suffered from serious depression yeah. and he needed medication. Because yeah. you know, I witnessed it, I watched it. You know, so, and, and, and um, it's, you know, it's, it's a struggle. I don't like it. I've never liked it, but I, I also have to understand that it's part of what makes me, me. So I might not have any abilities as a writer if I didn't have this. I have no mm -hmm. idea. I mean, maybe they're interconnected. I don't know. So maybe if somebody were to zap it out of my brain, I wouldn't be able to write anymore. Um, or act when I did act. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or have a sense of humor. I don't know. You know, um, it's part of who you are, part it's of how you part see of the, the world. world. It's part of how I see the world. And I'm so used to it because I am 58, came out when I was 16, so I've lived with it for so long. You know. Does I don't understand not having it. Not having. Yeah, I don't understand issues. not having mental health issues. Mm -hmm. To me, that's foreign. I just, mm -hmm. that, that's baffling to me. And I think, you know, I come from a field where mental health and when they use the term mental illness is so generalized mm -hmm. like the dsm which is i have my issues with encompasses pretty much anything that any human could ever feel at any given time okay yeah you know uh, so to me it's more like so when i'm sitting with people it's like so what matters to you what quality of life matters to you mm -hmm. how do you feel today how do you want to feel Mm -hmm. You know, and because I think that idea of mental health is just kind of a spectrum, like, sure, it's such a blurry thing. We're all struggling in a really difficult time. And I just kind of like start with that. Yeah, that's true. I, I will add that I hate the expression, you have to choose to be happy. Mm. I hate that expression. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's validity to it. Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell that to somebody who's homeless on the street? Sir, you have to choose to be happy today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that's something, you know, if you make the best out of what you have and get up and, and say, I'm going to do the best out of what the hands I was dealt. But when you're sick, when, you're, when you've got cancer, when you're on death, whatever, you're not choosing to be happy, you're choosing to survive. Okay. You're just doing the best to survive that day. And I tend to think that people who just toss around that phrase all the time haven't really experienced a lot of anguish in their life. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds cold, but yeah. I, I think that they probably haven't. And that, that, those are the Tom Cruises of the world. They probably haven't. They've just, they, so they don't understand it. Well, again, I, I think when people do that, I think, again, it comes back to this idea of what are they projecting? Yeah. What are they saying? You know, Tom Cruise is not someone who particularly emanates joy for me. I don't think no. he's a happy, peaceful, mentally well person. Yeah, yeah. And then he goes around, or he used to go around, um, criticizing, condemning people who get help yeah. for treating mental yeah. issues. Yeah. 
So back to that projection thing, it's like, so, you know, people are criticizing or condemning the parts of themselves. And, but I know that as someone who has issues that that stigma falls on you, you get, you're the recipient of that. Mm -hmm. It's still something easier in this culture to do. Though I hope and think it's changing. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of younger people aren't having it. Like I see yeah. people, younger professionals on, you know, for better or for worse on TikTok or whatever, talking really openly and honestly about, hey, I'm a doctor, I'm a therapist, I'm a firefighter, I'm a whatever. And I have this issue that I struggle with every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be ashamed of that. And I'm not going to accept stigma around that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really powerful thing. I hope that's helping to change the story. Yeah, yeah. I hope that's making it easier for people. Yeah, I think it is. I think yeah. it is. And I've noticed, like, when I tell people now, there tends to be not much of a reaction, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. There's a... <laughs> is there anything you want the people, you may have said it already, but is there anything, if someone's watching this, is there anything you want people to understand about mental health or to... It's common. Mm -hmm. uh, very successful people have it. Mm -hmm. Very many people have it. Very many accomplished people have it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's probably a lot more common than you think. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to somebody if you if you talk to somebody if you have it. Make sure you don't keep it inside. Um, that's the worst thing you can do. Tell somebody. Uh, were there other than medications? Have there been other tools or therapies that have been beneficial over these last? That's just helpful. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Bathtubs. Bathtubs are helpful. Yeah. Um, you know when you're sick. When you have a cold, I say this a lot. What do you do when you have a cold? Well, what do I, I can tell you what I do when I have a cold. I complain, mm -hmm. and <laughs> but I complain in a fun way. I call everybody I know and I say, I'm sick. You know, I just want you to know I'm sick. I lie down, I take, I wear a bathrobe, I watch stupid movies uh, or stupid TV shows. I eat ice cream, I eat cookies. I don't care, I just take care of myself. You know, for when I can. Sometimes you have to go out in the world and be productive and do all this. But when I can't, I don't go out. I stay in. You have to look. When you're sick, you're sick. No matter what it is. If you're having some sort of really bad... Sorry, I'm slipping in my eye. I'm not crying. Um, when you have something... A mental health issue, if you can, be good to yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't force it. Don't, fa don't fake it. Right. Tell people. Once again, that goes back to... The, in the same way that I tell people if I have a cold... Tell people, my OCD is really bad today. Yeah. I'm just going to start the conversation with, it's nice to talk to you, just so you know it's not you. If I sound like I'm upset during the conversation, you know, with phone calls, I have this with people, I, my OCD is really bad today. Also, when you do that, the cloud sort of lifts because you're keeping it inside and talking about it, talk therapy is is so helpful. Like just talking about like, like how does it, how does it, how does it come out? How does it emanate? That's not the right word. What's the word? Emanate. How does it emanate? Mm -hmm. um, right word. Yeah. How does how does it come out? How does it establish mm -hmm. itself? What are you feeling? Mm -hmm. um, what can I do? And often just that is so helpful. Yeah. You know? Would you say naming it in those conversations you mentioned? Just saying, hey, I'm having a difficult day today. My OCD is acting up. Does that also just mm -hmm. help to diffuse? Mm hmm. It, because then it seems like you're taking away a lot of its power. A lot yeah. Of power, right? Yeah, because it's like this sneaky little demon inside you that's trying to get you. And yeah. somehow it's like saying, I, my OCD is bad, but that's okay. It makes it much easier. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my sister and I, she gets terrible migraines all the time. So I call her and say, how are your migraines? And she goes, they're terrible. Or they're, it's okay today or whatever. And how's your OCD? You know, how's your anxiety? You know, it's, it's, we both understand that we both have things that affect the way we, we are health, you know, and she'll tell me right away, you know, if she's having a migraine, you know, and I used to not tell anybody I could be, that's where it's dangerous and that's where you're going to do something self-destructive and that's where you're going to get into trouble is when you just keep it all inside. So, you know, for young, the youngins out there, you know, seek help and. Get a good doctor. Oh, and then the 50 somethings, the 60 somethings. All, who, all of who us. Who grew up in this age of shame yeah. about mental health yeah. and about needing help. And finding a good, as you know, because you're a therapist, finding a good psychiatrist, because you need to see a psychiatrist and a therapist if you can. Finding a good psychiatrist is like finding a good anything. Yeah. 
You can't necessarily, you don't necessarily just go to the first one. Right. You, know, and, you have to find one you really relate to and really like. It's like finding a good vet. Right. You know, for your, for my dog, I have a wonderful vet. Right. You know, I love him dearly. But, you know, I saw 300 vets before I found them. Right. And I remind <laughs> people they are consumers of psychiatric service, not patients. Yes. That's yes. a really important difference. Yes. To find someone who you trust, find someone you can work with, mm -hmm. find someone who respects you, mm -hmm. which is sometimes really hard to do in mental health, mm -hmm. but that you are a consumer of psychiatric services. You have the right to be treated with dignity. Mm -hmm. And not everyone's the best match for everyone. You may need to go mm -hmm. or check out a few people. First. I've had a couple horrible people. Yeah. 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 Again, projection, yeah. which is really common amongst yeah. psych... I'm just going to say among psychiatrists and doctors in general mm -hmm. is to project their unresolved mental health issues yeah. well, here I am going to say mental illness issues project them on their mm -hmm. patients or their clients mm -hmm. and then act out accordingly it's such a dangerous dynamic and it is common yeah. and I, do you feel like that's ever happened to you? oh god yeah. yeah yeah. I've slammed doors on doctors I've sworn at doctors I've threatened to sue doctors yeah um, so this might be a place where social media is helpful, that if people are looking for a decent psychiatrist or doctor in their area, sometimes it helps to have a network to say, hey, mm -hmm. who here has someone they like? And the great news about the 21st century in the 20s that we're living in is that a lot of these doctors do telehealth now. So if there's not someone mm -hmm. immediate in your geographic area, there might be someone else. Uh, across the country who you want to work with and telehealth has made a lot of it possible to and to add to that This is why social media can be a good thing yeah. and Where we, we don't need to be talking about how much we hate the way Madonna looks we can we can use it for things like this You know you can reach out and, and do all these wonderful things with social media. Yes, Including and sharing this interview with people. Sharing this interview with people. And, and talking about these issues. Talking about aging. Talking about projection. Yeah. Talking about mental health. Talking yeah. about how, I think, empowering it can be to say, sometimes I need help and sometimes I'm having a shitty day. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for being so open. I just always love your transparency and how oh, open you are. Yeah. About these things. You inspire me, mister. Oh, thank you. Is there anything I have not asked you in this interview? That is burning for you. Uh, burning. Um, yeah, I'm imitating Madonna. Now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> She's tiny, by the way. I just had the one time I got to see her, I didn't get to meet her, but at the Glad Awards in 2019, um, I got to get pretty close to her. Tiny. She is such a tiny, tiny little, tiny little. Thing. Thing. I think we covered dad, son, yeah. Did we, anything we left out, or we really ran yeah, it down. Dad, son, Madonna, OCD, I think we're good for now. And sex. Dad, so, son, yeah. And these are ongoing in your penis. <laughs> and Angio Charisma. <laughs> Wasn't there like a sitcom about Angie and like she was Angio Charisma or something? Okay, maybe I'm There was a sitcom called Angie. Yeah. Um, Seems like that was her name, was Angio Charisma. Oh, I don't remember, okay. but I just saw that actress on something and I was like, that's Angie. That's and, great. Uh, That's great. So we've covered the gamut. I hope you will. I'm so glad you're here for the second time. I hope you will come back again to update us and talk more about, about these issues, about your penis, about life, about health, life after love, projection, celebrity. I mean, all of these are things are going to be with us indefinitely, okay. and yeah. I think are worth addressing and talking to. Yes. Um, so if people want to follow your work, read some of your blogs, commentaries, where would you recommend people do that? Um, I just guess go to Instagram. Well, I don't post everything. Everything's all fucked up now because I don't want to say Twitter because of, uh, um, go to Facebook, just David Toussaint on Facebook. I did start an OCD, OC David Toussaint page, Ooh. a page or whatever on, um, Instagram. Okay. Because I thought I would start talking about it there. I've hardly done anything with it, uh -huh. but I've noticed there were immediate all sorts of people started following it. Wow. So I would like to continue doing that, and this might encourage me to do more of it. I hope so. And talk about it and hopefully get other people to interact and talk about it. And again, that is one of the positive ways social media can help people reduce stigma, give mm -hmm. people information, education, and enough community to want to stay alive. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I've used it that way with PrEP and sexual health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it certainly can be used as a conduit of love and respect, mm -hmm. but unfortunately it gets used the other way quite a bit. But, okay, so if you 
want to follow David, you can do it there. The links are going to be right below on YouTube. If you have any links you want to update, just let me know and I will change them down okay. below on YouTube. And if you like this conversation, subscribe down below. Get more TED Talks. I'm almost on number 100. And all of these interviews are about just kind of creating this idea of like, how do we consider aging up in a way that is stronger, more fun, healthier, and more playful than we've ever been able to do before? I love having these conversations with you. I love having these conversations so, with you. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.